first I want to make a disclaimer. Uh, according to the mainstream media and according to members of our government, everything that I'm about to tell you is uh, completely without merit, invalid, by mere virtue of how I wear my hair. So, <laughs> that being the case, I want you to take everything I'm about to say with a grain of salt, as I am an unreliable, but recently showered hippie. <laughs> All right. So, um, I, what I've been asked to talk about uh, originally was my friend Alexis here, who is a rock star criminal defense attorney. Yeah. Put your hand up, yes. <laughs> she is one of the people that's helping defend the students who were all arrested here. And she and I work together on a lot of different issues, mostly surrounding the drug war. And, um, you know, the drug war becomes a central component to what I'm going to talk about here. And you'll kind of understand that uh, as we go on. So, uh, the real question, you know, becomes how did this event that happened here on this campus that was seen around the world come about? How is it that a police officer would so brazenly walk across a line of unarmed students, nonviolently protesting, and blithely pepper spray them? How did that happen? Was that an accident? Was it a fluke? Was it the bad apples argument? Was it just poor training? Well, I, I will put to you today that none of it was an accident. That in fact, what we have seen since all of your parents went to school uh, a generation ago is what's been about a 50-year process of the militarization of the American police force. Um, and this is a kind of piece of history that remains in a big gray area for a lot of folks. And it begins in the mid-1960s. Now, the setting back then was very different than it is today. The United States was at the height of its power. We were the richest country in the world. And most of your parents didn't have to pay much to go to school because education was pretty much free here. There were ample social services, right? And it was <clears throat> smack dab in the middle of the Civil Rights Movement, which was one of the most powerful social movements in American history, right? And as a result of that civil rights movement, as a result of the inequities that were going on in American culture at the time, and the Vietnam War, which is just starting to get ramped up in which large numbers of poor Americans were being conscripted into service, uh, there was a series of riots that occurred in American cities, mostly in the predominantly African-American ghettos. And between 1965 and 1968, there was something like 130 of them, okay? And these were major riots, I mean major. Anyone in your parents' generation should remember them. Um, they were concentrated in mostly the northern industrial cities, places like Newark and Detroit and Cleveland and Chicago. Uh, they began with the famous Watts riots in Southern California and Los Angeles, right? And as a consequence of that, you know, first of all, before I jump into that, you have to understand that policing back up until that time, and almost through exclusively in American history, has always been considered a local issue. And crime's always been considered a local issue. You know, it's something that was dealt with by local authorities, right? It wasn't something that the central or the federal government ever got involved in, uh, except for those crimes which were directly connected to the things that federal government stand for, which is like interstate commerce and treasury fraud and mail fraud and these things, right? So the federal government pretty much was about raising an army and kind of managing the administrative affairs of the country. Right? And then the riots happen, right? And then there's an entire class of Americans, 22 million strong, that are demanding equal enfranchisement. Now what this means in the scheme of things can't be understated. It also can't be understated in light of what the Occupy movement is asking for because it is essentially asking for the same thing, but it is not doing it under the veil of racism. It is doing it under the veil, not the veil, but the open request, I'm sorry, of economic equality, right? And that was the big bugaboo that started the riots back in the 60s. It wasn't just that the African-American community was so oppressed. It wasn't just that they were so brutalized by the police that they didn't have any economic opportunities. Uh, it, it was that the entire system uh, was starting to break. Here we were 
the world's beacon of freedom, and yet we were having a legal apartheid state with Jim Crow in our own country. Now, when that was overturned, when Johnson signed the Civil Rights Act, when the riots really started, particularly after the assassination of Martin Luther King, this is a very serious, serious issue that has almost been whitewashed from history. By the way, my, my next talk is going to be on the puppies, now and forever. <laughs> <laughs> How they bring such joy to our lives. You don't have to leave, actually. I really dig that little guy. <laughs> so, um, so th this is the part, I mean, you know, my uncle tells me, you know, if, if you ever go to Chicago, anybody here from Chicago, by the way? This is my hometown. There's a whole bunch of buildings that were built in the early 70s. And they don't have any windows on the first, like, five or ten floors. They I look like fortresses. Yeah, yeah, they, have, they look like fortresses. And these were all built as like a, a response to the riots, okay? Um, because they, the damage that was done, the danger that was imposed on the population can't really be understated, okay? So, as a result, uh, Lyndon Johnson, who was president at the time, he uh, passes this piece of legislation known as the Law Enforcement Assistance Program, okay? This is the first time in the modern era, and really in American history, that federal money right, is suddenly flooded down into the states uh, to the individual state and local police forces in order for them to bolster up their police forces, to buy new pieces of uh, hardware, to buy weaponry, to build new prisons, to expand the court systems, okay? And this was done, again, primary motive was a period of civil unrest, okay? Out of this period of civil unrest, the Vietnam War protests really mushroom, okay? And then by the 70s, what you were talking about is a widespread period of social unrest matched by a period of, you know, economic crisis. The early 70s and late 70s were pretty bad. There was a whole condition that was going on called stagflation. And it's really complicated. What it basically boils down to is that we were taken off the gold standard in the 70s in order to pay for the Vietnam War. We had gone bankrupt. We could no longer pay our creditors in gold, and they were demanding gold. So we had to go on this fiat system, which is now at the root of everything that we see here in the banking crisis. And as part of this, like, all of this money gets flooded down into these police forces. And you get this thing in the 70s, then, as a result of some of this kind of like what they would call terrorist activity, about what we could call insurgent activity, what we could call revolutionary activity, what we could just call plain discontent. Was they introduced this thing called SWAT, all right, Special Weapons and Tactics, and that was developed in Los Angeles. Uh, back in the 70s, there was a lot of bank heists. There were groups that were claiming to be, you know, on the various ends of the left spectrum that were, you know, advocating for more of a utopian world. They were advocating for more of a socialist world, advertising, advocating for more of a communist world, whatever it was. They all had their beefs. But the one way that they seemed to show a lot of it is through violent crime through trying to rip off the system and then use that money to fund their revolutions. There was a whole big rash of these types of bank robberies and groups like the Symbionese Liberation Army and all this that came out in the 70s. But as a result of that and as a result of some of these gun battles and like very public uh, expressions of violence that went on, the police force then started using military tactics. Now, if we jump back to the Chicago Convention in 1968, all right. This was a, another world-changing event. And what happened there was essentially that the new left, the protest movement from Vietnam, the civil rights movement, all converged on the convention to try to force Democrats through the electoral and democratic process to get out of Vietnam. And they were met by an overwhelming police and National Guard presence. And on national television, the Chicago police were given the order to clear the streets, and they brutally beat down the uh, protesters in a way that the American public had never really seen before, right? And also on the streets were the National Guard, right? During the riots, the National Guard was also deployed. Uh, over the years, there were something like 300, 400 people that were actually shot dead by the National Guard during the riots in the late 60s, okay? These are all parts of information that are not really told or taught in classrooms, okay? So, the 70s are happening, now we're starting to see this thing called SWAT. Now we're starting to see these things like helmets and gear and machine guns and all the big vans and these things start to enter the police lexicon. And then the 80s come around. And suddenly there's this thing known as the crack wars. 
right? <laughs> and what happened in the 80s is essentially as America was going through a process of deindustrialization, as the labor force was being offshored to cheaper labor markets, the northern industrial cities in particular, where most of the most poor workers are concentrated, most of them being African American, also Latino, right? these neighborhoods were then suddenly flooded with cheap available drugs. Right? There's lots of different speculations on where all that came from. I encourage people to look into that trail. It's a very interesting story in and of itself, but it's not the one that we're actually talking about right now. But as a consequence of the street violence that existed as a result of the economic conditions and as a result of the proliferation of cheap available drugs in this country, there was a tremendous death toll. And there was daily reports of violence on the news. And this is around the time that the kind of media programming around the idea of the criminal, the African American, the gang member, the drug dealer all started to become really popularized memes in the American consciousness shown on the television news every single night. Okay? So the drug war became the kind of vehicle by which we were able to infiltrate people's rights, their constitutional rights. And this all began with Richard Nixon. One of the reasons, one of the stated reasons that Richard Nixon started the war on drugs was because he knew that he couldn't go after his political enemies on political grounds. In other words, he couldn't sit down with the Weather Underground and the Students for a uh, Sensible, or Sensible Democracy and uh, uh, the um, uh, Black Panthers and all of these people that had legitimate political grievances because they wouldn't win the argument. They wouldn't win the debate. They actually had legal and political protections. But one thing they all had in common, one thing that counterculture had in common, was that they used drugs. And they were using drugs as a cornerstone of the platform of their revolution. You know, turn on to an end, drop out, get high, the whole nine yards. You all know all about what happened in the 60s. So what Nixon looked at was he was looking at a political crisis. He was looking at uh, a drug epidemic that was going on both at home, in the sense that the youth of America were getting high and starting to rethink what this whole American experiment meant. There was also a massive epidemic of addiction uh, in the soldiers that were serving in country in Vietnam and back in the United States. Now, one of the things that you may not know is that our government actively trafficked opium and heroin in the 60s to finance the Vietnam War. It's a model that we learned from the other colonial powers a hundred years ago. It's nothing new and it's nothing shocking. But as a consequence, of, I mean, it's nothing shocking in the sense it's not revelatory information, but it certainly is shocking as far as its consequence to policy, right, and to our, our culture. But what ended up happening was that all of this cheap dope that they were making, this stuff was flooded into the ranks of a largely dissenting uh, armed forces. People that did not want to be in Vietnam, they did not want to fight Right? They, they had had it. They were fragging their officers, they were failing to report for duty, and they were getting high because they had every right to. They were in hell, and there was no way they got of it. Hey Charles, do you want to explain what fragging is? Fragging is, is when you um, blow up your superior officers by throwing a hand grenade into him while he's taking a shit. <laughs> yeah, you wait for him to go inside, and boom, you turn him into an you know, officer in a can. Uh, and it was a real serious issue. And addiction amongst the troops was a very serious issue. It was so serious that Nixon feared that there would be this waves of millions of addicted troops coming home looking for fixes. The irony is that that same dope that ended up in the soldiers in country in Vietnam also ended up in the ghettos of America during this very same period of civil unrest. Okay? And that's not a coincidence. All right? And so it's, how many people have ever heard the term problem, reaction, solution, paradigm? Does anyone have any idea what that is? Okay, a couple of people out here. It's an interesting piece of political tool. It's a, what's known as a Machiavellian tool. All right, problem, reaction, solution is when a, a, a government or a ruling body creates a problem and then manages the reaction to that problem and then has a ready-made solution for that problem. In other words, if you flood an area with drugs and crime explodes, you react by saying, oh my god, Syria is flooded with drugs, crime has exploded. <laughs> and then you come in with more and more force, more and more repression, 
and you tax the people for that. You tell them that this is necessary for their freedom, for their safety, for their security. Now, this paradigm was used for almost 40 years in the drug war. Nixon's situation was that drugs were becoming such an issue that this middle class, this great silent majority that elected him, all of their kids were getting busted for these petty marijuana charges under, under these state laws, and they were going away to prison. Meanwhile, uh, there was no federal way of kind of controlling this issue, so he created the drug schedule in 1970, he created the DEA. The DEA is one of the first federalized police forces, and over the next 40 years they would grow to be extremely powerful and very dangerous. Throughout the 80s and 90s, the drug war became the place where federal money, federal training was funneled into police forces, federal military weaponry, and the idea of starting to go around or play with constitutional protections started happening <laughs> primarily, Alexis laughs, primarily the Fourth Amendment, which protects against illegal search and seizure. This became the cornerstone, the foundational bedrock that the police force started to erode our protections, okay? Then in the 90s, this significant event happened. You may have heard of it. It was called Waco. And Waco was essentially, I don't know, I don't know how old this group generally was about at that time. I was 23. This was back in 1993. And Clinton had just become president. And uh, what he wanted to do was to uh, find a way to militarize uh, the ATF, the FBI, and other domestic law enforcement agencies. In, order, in other words, to take... Pentagon funding, Pentagon training, Pentagon weaponry and technology, and use it for domestic police forces. Okay, that had never been done before. There's kind of this thing called the Posse Comitatus Act, right? Which was written many, many years ago, which pre prevented, prohibited our armies from being stationed on domestic soil and used against the domestic population. This was meant to prevent military coups, juntas, and the like that have plagued many societies for you know, thousands of years. So if we couldn't use our own military on ourselves, on our own population, we had to find a way to do it. We had to find a way to connect us all. So after all of this money starts going in for the drug interdiction, the drug war, then Waco comes around. And this was supposed to be a test. It was supposed to be a very simple bust where these ATF and FBI agents go in with all this military hardware around suspected gun dealers and, you know, they round them all up and they show everybody, see, this is how great this is. Let's, you know, earmark more billions for this. Except everything went wrong. Everything that could go wrong did go wrong. And they murdered a few hundred people. You know, I mean, they basically burnt them alive inside their compound. They were, they were evangelical Christians and they were living in their own space. They were living in Texas and they didn't want to be bothered by anybody. They were just into their <clears> own thing. And the way that they supported the farm that they lived on was by selling guns at gun shows, which in Texas is not a big deal. <laughs> okay? I mean, this is a legitimate way for people to make money down there, and everybody's got a gun. So the idea that like this, you know, peaceful group of Christians was suddenly, you know, a, an international network of, you know, gun-toting terrorists, uh, the public bought it. And then there was all of this you know, kind of like slander against the people that they were into this and child molestation and yada, 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 and the whole issue was swept under the rug. But the bottom line is the funding went through, and suddenly all of that militarization started to proliferate again. Now, uh, another significant event happened right around that time, which was the end of the Cold War. Okay? And with the end of the Cold War, all right, a lot of us were expecting what was known as the peace dividend. Oh, the war is over, the evil empire has collapsed, now we're all going to live in harmony. No. No. We must find something for you to be scared of. We must. Because you can't keep this multi-trillion dollar a year military industrial apparatus going without a clear-cut enemy to point it at. Except there wasn't one at that time. So we went from the Cold War and the Soviets being the big bugaboo to what are we going to do, what are we going to do? Drug lords. That's it. Pablo Escobar is now more powerful than the Soviet Union ever was. And so all of that money suddenly became focused in on coming out of the military because they were cutting the military and it was going into policing, it was going into the federal police forces, the DEAs, the FBIs, the CIAs, and so on and so forth. And the entire... Uh, 
you know, Cold War dividend was basically lost in what was known as a bridge move. And the bridge move was a 10 year long experiment known as the drug war, where we suddenly went from having drug dealers to narco terrorists, right? <laughs> Now, this is not to say that any of this stuff doesn't actually exist. Yes, there are people that have made unholy sums of money in the drug trade that control things that most nations would be jealous to have, right? I mean, they have incredible reach and power. However, this is all consequences of policies that this government here in the United States set up. And so with the drug war in effect, with us going into other countries like Colombia and Panama, arresting heads of state of other sovereign nations. Now, you guys hearing all this? Going into another country, taking their leader, their elected leader or whatever, bringing him to the United States and putting him into a federal prison because he's a drug dealer. Okay? Uh, this had never been done before. This is unprecedented when we did this to Manuel Noriega. Now, the reasons we did is a whole other story. That's another thing I encourage everybody to look into. But when you start to look at the entire Iran-Contra scandal, and uh, <laughs> some are slower to learn than others. Uh, <laughs> where was I? Iran-Contra, Noriega, yes. So then we went and assassinated Pablo Escobar, so on and so forth. This kind of started the trend of us going into other countries with our forces and executing our own style of justice. But then 9-11 happens. And then everything changes. Well, I'm sorry, you, you wanted to share something? Oh, thank you, thank you. Um, so 9-11 changes everything. Now, there were various attempts throughout the 20 years prior to 9-11 to pass certain pieces of legislation that were similar to the Patriot Act. Right? In the early 80s, there was a bill called the Omnibus Crime Bill. And then after the Oklahoma City bombing, there was a big piece of legislation that became to be known as the Domestic Anti-Terror Act, Comprehensive Domestic Anti-Terrorism Act, that Bill Clinton passed in 1996. Okay? But up until then, that was kind of like the, the harshest it got until 9-11. Now I'm going to read to you a list of legislation that has been passed since 9-11. Beginning with the Patriot Act, and I want you to understand that these, all of these have passed almost overwhelmingly. They've been bipartisan pieces of legislation. I don't know why Inush just called me. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> Okay, so in, in 2001, the Patriot Act was passed, okay? That started it. In 2002, the Homeland Security Act was passed. In 2002, the Support Anti-Terrorism by Fostering Effective Technologies, or the Safety Act, was also passed. In 2005, the Border Patrol, Anti-Terrorism, and Illegal Immigration Control Act was passed. In 2006, the Military Commissions Act passed. Now, the Military Commissions Act is kind of scary because it is very similar to this piece of legislation that is pending uh, Senate passing right now as we speak, right? Uh, we can talk about this when I'm done giving my address, but this is, again, a repeated attempt by our government to pass legislation which allows our government's military to arrest, detain, try, imprison, people, whether they are U.S. citizens or not, okay? It started with the Military Commissions Act of 2006, and what that said is in the event of a national emergency, the military can do all this stuff. That next year, they passed the Animal Enterprise Terrorism Act of 2007. The Animal Enterprise Terrorism Act means that if you take a picture of a confined animal feeding operation out here in the in the Central Valley, you can be subject to federal prosecution for taking a picture of a place where they torture animals to death and turn them into cheeseburgers. Okay? It's a federal offense to tamper with any of these places, and many environmental activists, people, members of the Animal Liberation Front and Earth Liberation Front, people that have performed nonviolent acts which is a kind of a great term, I'm going to let the counselor here kind of explain, because the federal government thinks that if you blow up a Humvee, it's a violent act. 
and these people argue that it's not because it doesn't hurt anyone. If you liberate a cow pen, right, where animals are confined, tortured, fed, and slaughtered, it's considered terrorism by our government. Not only that, but it's considered a special breed of terrorism so that if you are convicted or held with suspicion by our government for one of these acts, you are held in what's known as a communication management unit. <laughs> a communication management union is a fancy term for solitary confinement isolation. So you are put in a place where you cannot talk to your lawyer. You cannot talk to anybody in the outside world. You cannot talk to anybody else in the prison. You are in solitary confinement 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. Okay? This, this is not people trying to blow up our country. This is not people trying to kill other people. These are people trying to advocate for animal welfare. This is our government considering them that dangerous. A great source on this is a blog called greenisthenewred.com, okay? And it's by a guy named Will Potter, and he has been tracking all of this legislation very diligently for years, okay? Then in 2007, they proposed the Violent Radicalization and Homegrown Terrorism Act, okay? And this was meant to once again be focused at the domestic population. Listen to that violent radicalization, who are they talking about, and homegrown terrorism. Okay. This one languished because of the financial collapse, right? And they've tried to introduce it a couple more times, and the elements of this bill that they wanted, along with the elements of the next bill, the enemy belligerent interrogation, detention, and prosecution act of 2010. This came about after the Tea Party started having their protests. And the Tea Party would say some belligerent things. So they decided that they were so belligerent that they needed to pass a law making them illegal and making them subject to terrorist prosecution. The same provisions that are in that bill are in this one that they're about to pass now. Okay, that the ACLU has got a great website set up so that you can go contact your authorities. You want some pizza? In a minute. <laughs> it's not good to talk and eat at the same time. It's bad for digestion. <laughs> okay, so now what has happened since 9-11? Well, since 9-11, whatever we understood to be the foundational constitutional protections have been completely eroded. In fact, they haven't even been eroded. They've essentially been shelved. All of this legislation takes your 10 Bill of Rights and crumples it up into a big ball and tosses it in the garbage can. Now, when the Patriot Act was passed, that pretty much did it. That was so vague that it allowed the government, the president, the ability to determine anytime, anywhere who is a danger and who is not. But now with this new act, it can be anyone. It can be the military. It can be anyone in any deputized police force, any government agency, right? So we've seen increasing encroachments into people's lives. Now, I told you the drug war is where all this started. Well, where is that at right now? Well, right now, 400 times a day across this country, armed SWAT teams break down people's doors and haul them away. All right, this is 400 odd times a day. Most of the time, they are executing nonviolent drug warrants. All right? And if you look around on the internet, you'll find countless videos of SWAT raids gone wrong, of dead dogs, children, and people, where they got the wrong address, they got the wrong people, or they just came too heavy. Right now, how does the how does that happen? How does just recently, right in Iowa, pretty sure I'm forgetting the exact details, but it just happened like a week or two ago. The police went to execute a search warrant on a family because they were suspected that they had a stolen Xbox. They stormed into the house. They killed two of the dogs, shot them dead on sight. The father was, uh, he was disabled. He was thrown to the ground. Their 65-year-old grandmother was thrown to the ground. They were all hauled out, arrested. They searched the house. They didn't find the Xbox. <laughs> Sorry for shooting your dog. See you later. Bye. All right. 
There was a man that was, they executed a raid on the wrong house. They came in, they shot the dog, they shot the guy. All he had was a weed pipe. <laughs> and this is, goes on and on and on and on. Uh, I have been a, a direct action activist for many years. You know, 10 years ago, when the WTO protests started, when 9-11 happened, when the wars in the Middle East were launched, we were out there leading marches, demonstrations, rallies. This is when we started to see the infiltration of the police in a way that they had never been before. Uh, back in the 60s and early 70s, the FBI started a program called COINTELPRO. This is probably the most important piece of information I'm going to give you because you're all leading a movement right now. Okay? COINTELPRO was a brainchild of Richard Nixon and J. Edgar Hoover, two of the biggest bastards that have ever <laughs> held public office in this country. <clears throat> Hoover was the director of the FBI, and Nixon was the president. <clears throat> COINTELPRO and its CIA counterpart, unacknowledged CIA counterpart, Operation Chaos, were comprehensive plans to infiltrate, disrupt, and discredit the political movements of the day. Those are the student movements, the civil rights movements, the black nationalist movements, the anti-Vietnam movement. And what they would do would be to have agents involved in every student group, every political organization. They would be involved in every demonstration, every rally, every protest. Their job was to set people against each other in these movements, to spread lies, rumors, falsehood, innuendo, to start power struggles, and at events to act as what's known as agent provocateur, or in other words, to provoke a response in the demonstration, to smash a window, to assault a police officer, to incite a riot. <clears throat> now the irony in all of this is that there was a group of people in Chicago after the 68 convention who were put on trial, as known as the Chicago 10 trial, Chicago 8, the Chicago 7, however you want to describe it. And it was essentially all the people that they picked out as the leaders of the movements back in the 60s. And they were all tried under, inter under the Interstate Commerce Clause, essentially, which is what they use for the drug war these days, for crossing state lines with the intent to incite a riot. Okay? The irony is just absolutely delicious in all of this, because this is what federal agents do on a daily basis. <laughs> and so COINTELPRO was eventually exposed. And it was all released. Whatever documents were saved and not shredded certainly indicted the government enough at the time. And it also led to a lot of the people in the Weather Underground and such being able to be granted amnesty when they tried to come back uh, because, you know, they were part of unfair government repression. Well, that practice never stopped. It's been driven under many different names, underground, hidden, convoluted. But it still happens. Can I hold off for just a couple minutes and then we'll open it up for, for questions? Because I'm actually wrapping it up really quick here. Um, the hip hop movement in the 90s was greatly infiltrated by the FBI and the CIA. They were very, very concerned about the gang truce movement. And Tupac Shakur and Biggie Smalls' deaths were all intricately connected to what was going on in this infiltration and surveillance program. Um, it, it, it's really complicated, but basically the thing that you need to understand is that at this point our government considers anything a threat and they consider us a threat. I mean, they never stopped considering disenfranchised African Americans a threat, even after the whole Reagan 80s feel good shit. They were still heavily disrupting poor neighborhoods. The crack was still flowing in there. Gentrification hadn't begun and people were still really scared. It's a key political issue that is now starting to get bigger and bigger. Why? Because these types of revolutions always start with the poorest and most disenfranchised. But as that group becomes larger and larger, right, more and more people join in. Now what happens to the Occupy movement, the coordinated 18-city crackdown, is exactly that. It was a coordinated 18-city crackdown. Now, the people who are trying to detract from that, the people trying to say it didn't happen or there's no evidence of the Department of Homeland Security being involved, haven't been to an Occupy protest because all they need to do is walk around the corner and they'll spot the Department of Homeland Security van <laughs> sitting there. 
watching us. But more importantly, just because it's like it's called a straw man argument. People who want to prove you or take you prove you wrong or take you down pick one element of your argument that they think they can rip out. And so what they want is they want names and numbers and proof and a smoking gun and they want video footage and a sworn confession of whoever done it. And that's the only way that they're going to be convinced. What we do know is that all the police forces, the mayors, they all communicate with the federal government regularly, particularly in the post 9-11 Patriot Act era. This has been a relationship they have been cultivating and sponsoring and nurturing for over 10 years. Billions and billions and billions and billions and billions and billions of dollars from the federal government have flowed to police departments all across this country. Not even here, but even across the border to Mexico to arm their police across the border to Canada. Anywhere we want to have police repression, federal government money has gone and given them the tools that they wield out here, all that riot gear. By show of hands, how many people here think that a university police department needs that level of riot gear? Right. By the way, nobody's raising their hands. <laughs> Nobody. All right, so in conclusion, because I've kind of been rambling on this point for a while, this isn't an accident. This isn't just a situational response. What these people have been preparing for for a long time is a massive, catastrophic shift in American society to the American economy, to the American social structure, to the American middle class, our way of life, everything. Beginning in the very late 90s, right around the WTO period, right around the 9-11 period, if you started notes all across the country, public space started getting fenced in. People started getting booted out. If you want to study a movement, study the Tompkins Square tent city of the mid-1990s. That was the last big Occupy movement, and it was huge. That entire park in New York City was occupied for years by homeless, disenfranchised people who had nowhere else to go until Giuliani decided that it was bad for business, that they wanted to redevelop the area, and so they came in and they kicked him out. And it was violent, and it was bloody, and it was bad. And there's lots out there on it. So I encourage people to look that up. And these trends were only going to get worse. And anybody who understands macroeconomics and all of the trends, understand that this is where we've been headed. In this global economy, there's winners and losers. And we're about to start losing really bad because we've been taking too much of our share. And as our middle class evaporates, as our dollar inflates beyond any point of worth, as more people are out of work, as students can't find jobs, as social discontent rises, People riot, people freak out, people organize, movements begin, mountains start shaking. That's what they're afraid of. It doesn't matter to them, they're going to put it down no matter what. What we saw here over the last six weeks is the beginning of this movement. It's just the beginning. There are, in your generation, 78 million Americans. 78 million millennials, echo boomers, children of the baby boomers. You are the largest and most powerful generation this country's ever seen. I'm what's known as a Gen Xer. I'm like the beat generation. I'm one of those very <laughs> small generation that was in between two great generations. <laughs> and the beats laid the ideological foundation for the baby boomers, just as the Gen Xers laid the ideological foundation for the millennials. All right? But what it is now is your responsibility. I mean, it's our responsibility in the end all together. But those of you just getting into this, know what you're getting into. Know that it gets worse before it gets better. Know that all, through all the speech of love and nonviolent revolution, which are the cornerstones of this movement, remember, though, that all nonviolent revolutions are very violent. It's just that the violence is one way. And one group decides to take that violence that the other is imposing. Take that pain, take that shame, break in order to heal and be reborn. So I'd like to open this up for questions if anybody has them, and I really want to thank you all for listening to me today. <laughs> I think the safest way to look at it is that it permits the military, it gives them discretion. 
So the discretion started off with, you know, it used to be an act of Congress can only take us to war or get us involved in another country. Then suddenly the national security state came around. Then this NSA CIA group could do it. Now, after the post 9-11 era, we rewrote the book so that the president could go do whatever he wants. Now they're getting to the point where they're giving that discretion to other bodies like the military. This would allow the military discretion to detain you, try you, imprison you uh, without representation, without due process of law, for indefinitely, for anything that they deem in the national security interest. That's the key buzzword, you know, national security issue. Um, the other thing is that to understand about the Occupy crackdown is that it perfectly follows the framework that was set up by FEMA. It was originally set up by FEMA as a response to in case there was a nuclear war or some kind of mass catastrophe, but in the 9-11 area it became about integrated communication of law enforcement and first responders between Washington and the various cities. So this framework they've been nurturing and perfecting for 10 years. It isn't that big a stretch of the imagination to figure that they all get on a conference call and decide how to get these you know, people out of here. They can consider Occupy uh, movement that if they want to. Uh, and as soon as they can point to an incident and say that's considered not in the public interest. I mean, right now they're just getting rid of it to get rid of it because they want to show that they have the force. They want to see if it'll come back. You know, they figure, okay, well, you know, it was nice. It was fall. They were hanging out. Now it's going to be winter and Christmas is coming. And they're all going to go home to their families and they'll forget about it. And it'll be done. And that's what they're expecting. Expecting all of you to go away, to get bored. You're young, you have terrible attention spans. <laughs> you don't give a shit about this. Eventually you're gonna have to go on to the next bigger charge. You know, it would be great if we could prove them wrong. It really would. But that's what it's gonna take. I mean, movements take life. <coughs> and they take, you know, sustainability. And so what they're doing is they're hitting it right at, the, right at the pain points where they know that they can break a movement's neck. They tried to find out what the one demand was, because that's the easy way to take it out. And then we, they wouldn't give them a one demand. So, well, who's in charge? Well, hey, you just take out who's in charge. Or you make them famous, one or the other. You either put them on TV and give them lots of money and piss everybody else off, or you kill them. One or the other, either way. Then they're all going to do is bitch about that guy. He was right. No, he was a saint. No, he was terrible. He was irrelevant. You know? So they want to try to do these little things. They couldn't do that, they couldn't do that, and in the end, boom, bye, get out. I mean, this is, this is kind of like, in many ways, this is like the last, the last uh, fort <laughs> that's being held, you know? Almost all of them have been evicted. Now, the question is, where will they pop up next, and how will they pop up next? And that's what I'm hoping to see. It's real simple. It's social control. It's in for, for what end I mean. to maintain the system of power, the system of the economic system, okay. the governmental system. I mean, I mean, aside from the fact that when you say the word U.S. government, what you're doing then is pigeonholing the discussion monolithically, because the U.S. government is a gigantic, multifaceted being, right? What we're talking about is a small cabal of people. Cabal is the best term to use. It's an organized group that are all working towards one end. You don't want to you can use the term conspiracy because it is a conspiracy. But what's essentially happening is that they have almost autocratic rule over this country and, more importantly, the economic system and the legal system. So they, they are essentially legislating themselves into criminal activity and then allowing the legislative process to enrich them Look into Delaware-based corporations. Look into like the entire movement around how Congress people, senators, sitting members of government are allowed to not only own Delaware-based corporations, be investors in them, but they're also allowed to pass laws in favor of their own corporations. This is one of the three demands that the actual movement, the Occupy movement, put out when they said, well, what are your demands? To reform the banking system, right? And these, you know, get money out of politics and end the ability for our elected officials to turn themselves into millionaires through our legal process. As soon as they articulated that demand, boom, the coordinated crackdown began. So it's not like this Alex Jones bullshit where, like, 
you know, a dark cloud is going to descend on America and we're going to have jackboots on every corner because not all fascism wears jackboots. Most of it wears business suits, right? <laughs> and that's the reality. And so what, what I've been trying to tell people, I've been saying for years that we live in a police state, but everyone looks at you like you're nuts when you say that. Except that, think of it this way. If I set a sprinkler system in your building, right? That sprinkler system is still there. It's integrated into every single floor. You had to pay for it, design it, build it in, fail test it, all of that. And it's just gonna sit there until the fire starts. But as soon as the fire starts, bam, it's going off. That is the way that our police state operates. As long as you get up and go to work and spend, we don't have to bother you. We'll be around when you get drunk, because you act like an asshole when you get drunk. <laughs> and we'll get you, and God forbid you don't do these things that we don't want you to do, like sell these things that aren't taxed or any of that. But for the most part, go do your thing, just show up, stay quiet, go to work. The minute you start doing this, that's when they show up, and look how they show up. Look how they show up to this movement, and tell me we don't live in a police state. Why? Because somebody's got to pee at an Occupy camp in the corner, suddenly that's the reason to evict like hundreds of people? You know, because it's unsanitary. I mean, it's just, it's a joke. <laughs>